in the Cambrian, fossil fish appear for the first time. So they are vertebrates like lampreys are today. And if uh, hagfish are actually more primitive than lampreys rather than being a sister group, um, uh, there were also cranates. So there were jawless fish in the Cambrian period, um, which had about the level of complexity as modern hagfish and lampreys. By the Ordovician to the Silurian periods, uh, there are trace fossils in the Ordovician and then body fossils in the Silurian of jawed vertebrates, of nathostomes. This would include the extinct groups of placoderms and acanthodians, but would include sharks. So sharks, fossil and modern, are nathostome fish. They have jaws, just like every, I think, uh, in yellow. So within vertebrates, there is a group of jawed vertebrates. Within the jawed vertebrates, the nathostomes, there is a group known as the osteichthyans, which would include all of the vertebrates on land, but also then the bony fish, like bowfin uh, and teleost fish alive today. Those are the ray fin or actinopterogene fish, as we'll see. And then the lungfish um, and the coelacanth alive today. They are sarcopterogean fish. Um, now, uh, they share uh, features. So uh, an example would just be when we start looking at skulls. Uh, I can uh, see cartilage in the lamprey skull and we can make homologies where you know, these pieces of cartilage are kind of homologous to these components of the human skull. But you know, it, it's not as obvious and very often they're parts of bones. Once we get to uh, sharks, we can do that uh, uh, to a greater degree. But here, when we look at, say, the skull of a bony fish like this bowfin, we can see that there are lacrimal bones. I have those as well, all right? And so there are maxillary bones. I have uh, those. Um, the jaw is no longer made of pieces of cartilage derived from gill arches. Those are just the embryonic scaffold. Um, the uh, bowfin has nasal bones, has parietal bones. So a lot of the bones of my skull, for the first time I can find in fish, in lampreys and cartilaginous of fish and placoderms, there are no points where I can say, aha, this is a bone that I have. Some of the bones of uh, these fish skulls uh, I had once, so I once had premaxillary bones, but they fused to my maxillary, um, and then, um, uh, the jugal I have a modified and now called a zygomatic. Uh, the temporal bone comes in pieces, but at any point, even though it's not directly uh, like that, um, uh, the human skull, obviously there are differences here. Nevertheless, these bones are homologous. And so we osteichthians, we share features like the bones of our uh, skull. And there are so many more, many of which I'll get to um, uh, later when we get to uh, the airbag, which would be transformed into lungs, um, et cetera. The vertebrae are uh, strengthened. There's changes in the nervous system. And so osteichthian fish in the fossil record are not just interesting because they're important, and osteichthians are the most common fish alive today, but also because we are osteichthians. And when we find osteichthians in the fossil record, it means that if we are asking how did human complexity come to be, this means that by this point in time, there were a few more uh, traits um, present in ancestral vertebrates, those traits which humans and other osteichthians uh, share. And so um, by uh, the late uh, Silurian period, there is a new type of uh, fish. Uh, and let me just uh, kind of reiterate in these next couple of videos, a couple of the points I had made with the, uh, with the skull. The vertebrate skull was built in pieces. The oldest part of the skull, which we call the splanchnum cranium, if you ever study comparative anatomy, is the gill arch skeleton. Now, the gill arches would be modified to become the first um, uh, jaws. Um, bone would later uh, uh, form over that. Um, but we humans still have remnants of this gill arch skeleton today in some ear bone, the hyoid bone, the larynx, uh, etc.
Um, cartilage started to form around the brain, around the ear, around the nasal capsules, etc., and then became more elaborate over time. So sharks have a more elaborate condocranium, the cartilage part of the, uh, the skull, and we humans, we still have a number of elements of our skull which is derived from the condocranium. But it was the later jawless fish that then decided to put bone here. Now, um, the early bone was in these big bony plates. We don't have those. Um, placoderms had big bony plates. Acanthodians had lots of little bones. Um, but by the time we get to the Osteichthyans, not only are there little bones, but we recognize them. Ah, see that dark blue one? That's a lacrimal like I have. Um, here, see this parietal? Uh, that's... Um, uh, one that I have. And if one were to ask, what would I have to do to take this fish skull and make it into an amphibian skull? Um, the answer is not all that much. You just have to reorient some of the bones and make the bones which protect the gills go away. And so what I've just done with only minor changes is transform uh, the skull of an early osteichthyan fish into that of a uh, of an early uh, tetrapod. Um, and so I have another video here about, you know, the bowfin skull and the homology, you know, where I, I studied that specifically. Um, now, when we talk about the osteichthyan fish, one of the first things that we should point out is that there are two groups, one which most people know and one uh, that most people don't tend to think of. And so this just is an important difference to make from the outset. So when we start to look at fish fossils, and they can be huge. I mean, there was a fossil fish that was more than 100 um, uh, feet uh, long. Um, they are different groups. As I mentioned in the previous uh, video, for example, there were acanthodians, fish which have some of the features of osteichthyans, like they do have bone and little pieces of bone, um, but they, are also, they also then have shark-like um, uh, features, and so uh, they are uh, truly uh, transitional. Um, by the, uh, the Silurian, uh, then we have um, these Osteichthyan uh, fish, and then we even have these two groups. So let me just def define these groups. If you were to look at the fin of this fish, I think a lot of people would be of the mind, oh, that's about what a fish fin looks like. I know fish fins. These, however, are also fish fins. So this is a South American lungfish, and these are its fins. This is, uh, I believe it was an African uh, lungfish as opposed to uh, an Australian lungfish. Here are its fins, right? And so notice that when you think of fish fins, um, most fish don't have fins like this, which are fleshy with uh, bones going down uh, the middle. That's because there are different groups of fish. As I will get to in just uh, a minute, I'll go back to fins. Um, there are different kinds of scales in fish. So most scales don't look like this. See how white they are? That's because they're made of enamel. In the previous um, video, I had said that placoid scales from sharks, they're pointy. Sharks have a raspy appearance because their scales actually have tooth stuff enamel and dentin. Um, well, that's not just true of sharks. So primitive bony fish also then have, uh, you know, these ganoid scales have uh, enamel and dentin uh, in them. And so when we start talking about the bony fish, one of the important things uh, then uh, to uh, uh, to realize is that there are different groups of uh, bony fish, including ones which you know most people aren't as uh, familiar with. So the biggest distinction is this: that um, the bony fish which have the fins that you might be more familiar with, which have cartilage rays uh, going through the fin, and the muscles which move the fin are the muscles of the body wall. So it's muscles here, say in the chest, which are moving the uh, body wall. That is what is known as an actinopterygian fin, and these fish are known as the ray fin fish. 
In contrast, um, there are fish which, instead of having these cartilage rays, have a series of bones in their fins. And their fins are more fleshy because there are muscles attaching to the bones, uh, which then, uh, then move uh, the fins. Now, these fish have never been the most dominant nor the most common, but it is from these fish that amphibians evolved, so we'll be getting back to those. First, I'd like to talk about the Actinopterygian fish, which are important because they make up the majority of fish. But then I'd like to talk about the Sarcopterygian, or lobe fin fish, because that is the group from which um, amphibians uh, evolved. Uh, so bony fish first appear in the Silurian uh, period by uh, the late Silurian, and then in the Devonian, they start to diversify. There are, um, uh, at least we think, both the ray fins and the uh, lobe fins, both the Actinopterygians and Sarcopterygian fish, um, by the end of the Silurian uh, period. So that division that I just mentioned, it's a very basal uh, uh, division in uh, the bony fish occurring you know, near you know, their origins. Now, when we consider these early fish, um, these are not bass, nor trout, nor marlin, nor tuna, nor flounder, nor catfish, etc. The fish of today were not alive in the Paleozoic. And not only were these extinct fish, um, but they have features which modern bony fish do not have. But they had uh, feature, uh, features which were typical of placoderm fish, sharks and other cartilaginous fish, and the acanthodians. So they had um, similarities of their pectoral girdle, the median fin spine, like uh, placoderms, this is in uh, the oldest uh, oste osteopian fish last um, I checked. I mean, obviously, there can always be more uh, fossils discovered. Uh, the brain case is like the Sauropterygians. The scales are like the Actinopterygians. And so these early fish are basal, not yet firmly split into this lineage of ray fins or this lineage of Sarcopterygium, but having traits of both, but then also having traits which link them to more primitive uh, groups of uh, fish which had come uh, before. And so uh, these are uh, truly transitional fossils. Saurolepis, which is either a basal um, osteichthian or more on the Sarcopterygian side, once again has transitional uh, features. Some of these fish will have eye stalks, a piece of cartilage to support the eye inside the orbit that sharks have, but that bony fish uh, do not. Um, and so when bony fish first appear, they are clearly intermediates. The complexity of bony fish and other osteichthians evolved in stages over time rather than appearing all uh, at once. And that is true whether we look at, you know, Guiyu and Sarolepis, um, but then there are also other transitional uh, fish uh, from the late Silurian and early uh, Devonian uh, where we could say the same uh, thing. So when uh, the bony fish first appear, it is not uh, the fish of today, but rather transitional fish, uh, which have a number of intermediate um, features. I'd like to say a few words about the ray fin fish, the Actinopterygian uh, fish, um, simply because, uh, uh, well, they are the most abundant fish with, you know, 25,000 species uh, or more. There are more species of uh, these uh, ray fin fish than there are birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians combined. So when we think about vertebrates, the uh, aquatic vertebrates, particularly this group of fish, the most successful group of fish, outnumber the vertebrates on land. Now, this fish looks a little different. It's called a sturgeon. The next fish is a gar. They are primitive bony uh, fish. Look at the tail. The tail was kind of like a shark's uh, tail, more so than the tail that most bony fish have. Um, fish like these have those white scales uh, made of uh, enamel. Um, and so uh, I'll be talking about their uh, swim bladders uh, uh, presently. Uh, so 
This is a primitive group of bony fish known as the chondrostians. So in the Paleozoic era, once again, there were no bass, there were no marlin, um, etc. Um, but there were these chondrostian uh, bony fish, which have a number of uh, primitive features, unlike the teleos. So the same would be true of this gar. All right. And so um, bony fish evolved in stages. Chondrostians, um, uh, like uh, sturgeons and uh, gar, they are uh, primitive and their ancestors hail back to the Paleozoic. The bowfin is a little bit more um, advanced. It's called the bowfin, known as this prominent long dorsal fin. Um, uh, the bowfin uh, is a, a primitive, what's called a neopterygium uh, uh, fish. Uh, and so uh, before we get to the teleost fish, which are the most abundant fish alive uh, today, uh, there were other groups of bony uh, fish. You may remember that I had said that sharks in the Paleozoic were much more diverse um, because the, um, the bony fish were not yet adapted to all of the ecological niches that uh, they are uh, today. Uh, and so uh, there are these different kinds of fish. They have different kinds of uh, scales. I had shown you an image, uh, but in the video playlist, uh, I go into uh, the types of scales a little bit uh, as well. It would be in the Mesozoic era, after the extinction of the Permian. So the Paleozoic era ends with the worst mass extinction in the history of uh, the vertebrates. And um, it is at that uh, time that the first teleost fish arise. So sharks and other jawed vertebrates like placoderms, etc., cetera, um, they originated in the Paleozoic, as did the primitive bony fish like the sturgeons and the gars, etc. But when you look here, all of these fish are teleost fish. So when we think of fish, Certainly there are sharks alive. Um, today there are gar and sturgeon, but almost everything that you think of as a fish belongs to a group known as the teleost fish. There were zero teleost fish in the Paleozoic era. So since fish start 500 million years ago and the Mesozoic starts 250 million years ago, that means that the most common group of fish alive today, the teleost, zero of them exist in the first half of fish history. So the Paleozoic from 540 million years ago to 250, that's half of the history of fish. And there are zero members of the most common group of fish, the teleos, known from the Paleozoic. Now, the uh, teleos will do a number of things. Uh, one is they change the swim bladder to being a structure which can be used for breathing. And now it was a, a structure primarily used for buoyancy. And this and other changes means that teleost fish are really maneuverable. Look at this um, fish, how easy it can change direction. A shark, for example, can't do that. A shark can't hover, quickly change directions or dart about. Um, and so the teleost uh, fish, this swim bladder uh, gave them much greater buoyancy. Changes in their musculature um, gave them a stronger bite and the ability to suck in, which could let them capture uh, fish uh, in uh, their mouths um, uh, uh, suddenly. Um, and so if you just look at how they can maneuver, far more versatile uh, than uh, the non uh, teleost fish. And like Aya said, uh, these then make up the majority of the uh, fish alive uh, today. So that would be true in both uh, freshwater and aquatic environments. Uh, here, when we think of a fish, uh, fish they are teleost uh, fish. Uh, but once again, uh, they are not known from most of Earth's uh, a history in the Precambrian, there are zero fish at all. And in the Paleozoic, there are no um, uh, teleos fish. And so when one considers bass, then just a take home message is that 
Uh, bass haven't always uh, existed. Um, so bass um, belong to a series of biological groups. So yes, they are vertebrates. Yes, they are jawed vertebrates. Yes, they are osteichthyans. Yes, they are teleos. Um, but you know, as we get into these smaller and smaller groups, these smaller and smaller groups, they evolved in stages throughout time. Um, and so if you were then to ask, well, let's look at all of these groups in uh, the fossil uh, history. Um, so for example, the first fish are known from the Cambrian, the first jawed fish somewhere between the Ordovician and the Silurian, the first Osteichthyan fish by the end of the Silurian, the first Actinopterygian fish by about the same uh, time. Um, and then after the Chondrosteans, we get primitive Neopterygians like the Bowfin's uh, ancestors. But notice that in all of the Paleozoic era, there are zero teleost fish. The first teleost fish originate in the Triassic uh, period, and then they diversify. So if we look at the teleos, we could split them into subgroups, into orders like order Persiforms, into superorders, etc. And so the first members of the euteleos come a little later, neoteleos, percomorpha, the order Persi uh, Persiforms, the family Centrarchidae, uh, uh, which includes uh, uh, bass, uh, the genus that um, bass um, uh, or uh, 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 are found in, uh, et cetera. And so it, uh, bass have not always existed. So when one finds fish fossils here, there are no bass. And in fact, uh, the fossil evidence indicates that uh, the groups uh, which include bass evolve very slowly over long periods of time. So that's certainly a significant um, message because that applies to all of the ray fin fish, the actinopterygian fish, which are the majority of fish alive today. But I would like now to move into the sarcopterygian uh, fish, which are important because uh, they are the ancestors of the amphibians and then all of the vertebrates on land. And so um, by um, 400 million years ago or so, there was a group uh, within the, um, the Osteichthians known as the Sarcopterygian uh, fish. Now, they evolved slowly, uh, and so there are a number of lineages. Uh, one early branch would lead to the lungfish, which are alive today. A later branch would lead to the coelacanths, which are alive today. So there are two types of Sarcopterygian uh, fish alive today, lungfish and, um, and uh, coelacanths. Um, but then there was you know, a, di a great diversity of Sarcopterygians in the Devonian period. And then by the end of the Devonian uh, period, some of these fish, which had become more and more like amphibians over time, um, then at some point, then uh, be, you know, uh, are not fish which are adapted to land, uh, but rather uh, the first uh, tetrapods. Right? And so I'd like to talk about those. Now, to suggest that amphibians and life on land evolved from fish, well, you know, on the outset, it seems, you know, certainly odd or at least um, unlikely, given that, you know, isn't it different breathing in air versus breathing in water? Like tetrapods, they need lungs. How could that evolve? Um, well, first off, let's admit that while fish can have gills, very often that's not enough, as you can see here. These fish are coming to the surface because in this stagnant water, their gills are not bringing in sufficient oxygen. So they're actually gulping oxygen out of the air. Now, not every fish can do that. Uh, the fish have to modify parts of their body to make them better able to do that. Um, and so this um, uh, fish, uh, this mud skipper, is out, you know, its head is out of the water and it's breathing the air. Fish can do that. Um, if they modify some mo modify their, their mouths, make them more vascular, some modify their pectoral fins, some have lost their scales can breathe through their uh, uh, their skin. There are different parts of the body which certain fish have been able to modify in order to uh, be able to breathe the uh, the air. So lots of fish can breathe um, 
of the air and they've modified different structures to do so. But what I'd like to talk about is the swim bladder, which is one of many uh, structures which a, a fish lineages have adapted for uh, breathing uh, the air. So the osteichthyan swim bladder goes back to the first osteichthyans, all right? So the uh, earliest uh, uh, bony fish include ancestors of, you know, chondrosteans like uh, gar and sturgeon and bowfin. And if you look at these, and I have uh, dissected uh, a few like this gar, notice that there's a bag known as a swim bladder. It's not a trivial bag. Notice if you can make this out, this is the length of the abdominal pelvic, I, my fault, it's the length of the ventral body cavity. And so this stretches essentially from the, uh, you know, the near throat region all the way down to the pelvis. There is this bag here in this scar. Sturgeons have them as well. Look at how big it is, all right, uh, from uh, this uh, gar. So it stretched the entire length of the body cavity. In the bowfin here, we could see the same. So the osteichthians from the beginning had a bag, a swim bladder. Now today, most fish use the swim bladder for buoyancy. And so it's easy to then assume, since most fish use it for buoyancy, that that must have been its original function. But that is not correct. Um, the, or, well, I'm sure it helped with buoyancy, but the most primitive bony fish alive today use that swim bladder to trap air, to breathe. So they can come to the surface, get a gulp of air, and then do gas exchange from the gap, uh, the swim bladder. Don't they have lungs? They do. Uh, my fault. Don't they have gills? Uh, they do. But the gills are not enough. The gills are not sufficient to get uh, to perform uh, gas exchange. And so then this uh, swim bladder supplements the oxygen they're getting from the gills. So um, these fish, especially in stagnant water, are getting oxygen both through gills and through this big bag, a swim bladder where gas exchange occurs. The swim bladder opens into the esophagus, but so too do the lungs of salamanders empty into the esophagus. There are divisions in the swim bladder to increase surface area for gas exchange, um, and that's true of lungs as uh, well. If you were to look under a microscope, you could see here in the lining of the swim bladder, here's the air, Here's layer of epithelia, and then here are capillaries. And notice that these cells are kind of flat. Well, that's what we find in lungs. We find that there are air sacs lined by thin, flat cells, and then the capillaries nearby uh, can then perform a gas exchange. So when we look at the swim bladder under the microscope, it is approximating a lung. Now, it's not a lung because it's one single structure. The sarcopterygian fish, they take the um, one single swim bladder, which was in the first bony fish, and they then now split it into pairs. So this is a lung fish, and it's called a lung fish because it has lungs. It doesn't have one single swim bladder. It has a pair of swim bladders, in essence. It has a pair of lungs. And look at these big blood vessels. Look at how much blood is being sent to these, um, uh, uh, to uh, these lungs. Now, I'm not being generous with this term. Oh, you know, let's be generous. Let's call them lungs. No, they're lungs. They actually. Um, so here's a swim bladder in a perch. Um, uh, but once again, those were true lungs in the. Um, those were true lungs in the Sarcopterygian uh, fish. And so, um, sarcopterygians are uh, a subgroup of the bony fish, all right? So they would include lungfish, but the tribe Sarcopterygia also then includes, um, oops, well, this is just as good, uh, also includes um, humans and all vertebrates on land. You know, belong to this group Sarcopterygia, just like these Sarcopterygian fish. Here is a lungfish, and notice two things. One, look at these fish fins. 
We'll get back to those. They're not like your typical fish fins, right? I mean, so they've got bones in the middle. They don't have those cartilage rays. But look at what it's doing. It's at the surface. It just took a gulp of air. And now it's going to go down to uh, the bottom in order um, uh, to sit there. And as it sits there, it's not only taking in oxygen with uh, its gills, which they do have, but now also performing gas exchange with the oxygen that it just uh, took into its lungs. Um, amphibian lungs don't work very well. So when I say that lungfish have lungs, I, I mean it. I mean, a lot of salamanders don't even have lungs. They just do all their breathing through uh, the skin. So uh, these lungs are pretty good. In experimental conditions, um, lungfish have been able to only breathe air for three years. My fault, I, I think in the wild for three years and in a lab for five years. Um, sometimes streams dry up and these lungfish will kind of burrow and, and make a little you know, kind of membrane around themselves like a little cocoon, if you will. And they can spend years waiting for the rain to return and, you know, then to uh, go back into the aquatic habitat. But they can then um, be um, uh, breathing uh, oxygen out of the air for that entire time. So look at this pelvic fin. It doesn't look like a fish fin. Um, and we'll be talking about legs in just a bit. So if you were to wonder, how could fish evolve the ability to live on land? Because they would need lungs. But the truth was they already had lungs. All right, so fish had the ability to breathe oxygen from the air before they came out onto land. These lungfish alive today um, and the fossil sarcopterygians um, had um, uh, split the ancestral swim bladder, which could already perform gas exchange. And now they had made it into a pair of lungs, which was uh, more uh, efficient. Um, uh, once again, uh, the sarcopterygians are so much like the, uh, uh, the first amphibians, the tetrapods. If you were to take a sarcopterygian uh, fish like Eustenopteron and say, what do I need? to change the bones into the, the bones of an early amphibian, not a lot, all right? Reposition the eye a little bit, lose the bones uh, which um, protect uh, the gills, and that's about it. So there is no bone in the head of an early amphibian that these sarcopterygian fish didn't already have. They just had then to modify the bones which were already there to then become the, um, uh, the skulls of the first uh, amphibians. Now we see transitional fossils. So one of the things that the fish evolved as they adapted to breathe air better is that they took their second nostril. Now, I know that sounds odd, but like, for example, if you dissect a shark, you'll notice they have two nostrils, one here and one there, because the nostrils aren't to breathe, they're just to smell, like blood in the water, for example. So water will come in this hole and then leave this hole. So it's just a tube through which water passes, um, but then they can smell as they go. What one fossil sarcopterygian had done was it had moved the second nostril to this spot here, all right, along the uh, jaw uh, margin. And then later sarcopterygian fish moved it to the roof of the mouth. So that Kenichthys was a transitional fossil. You can see that this second nostril was uh, intermediate between its original position there and there. Once it's here, it's uh, known as the internal naris or coena. Because what I can do is this. I can inhale and the air doesn't come out a second hole here. The second hole is here, okay? Now it's a little farther back in my mouth than it is here. Um, but in frogs, for example, it would be here. In turtles, it would be here. And so now the air can just keep on going into the lungs. So once the fish moved their second nostril, they could now breathe through uh, their nose. And so um, when we look at the skulls of amphibians. The skulls of amphibians are different from the skulls of fish, clearly. But the first amphibians, they still had fangs on the roof of their mouth, like the fish. 
So here's a Sarcopterygian fish, which still has bangs on the roof of its mouth. Number of fish do. Right? You can have not only the small marginal teeth in the maxillary bone, but you can have, um, notice these other teeth on other uh, skull roof, or, or uh, uh, bones in the roof of the mouth. Um, but amphibians, and even then the early reptiles, would then have these as well. The first, in, uh, uh, the first fish had a, a space between the parietal bones um, where light could enter uh, what's called the pineal foramen and reach uh, a part of the brain which detects light known as uh, the uh, pineal gland or pineal organ, sometimes called the third eye. Um, but or all of the early amphibians and reptiles would have this. Some of you know the uh, uh, reptiles uh, still have this uh, uh, today. If you were to look at other features of uh, the skull, um, like how amphibians you know were adapting the skulls um, uh, to uh, perceive light. Uh, on uh, land uh, with the position of uh, the eye uh, or with the position of the uh, middle ear. I'm sorry, I have this somewhere. Um, the fish were uh, making some of these uh, changes. I'll actually, I'll get into that more in the next uh, topic on uh, amphibians. Um, but uh, just then to, um, uh, to summarize, a lot of the changes which we saw in fish, like changing the second nostril, moving the eye uh, more dorsally, modifying the ear to hear on land. Um, these actually occurred in the fish as they adapted to land. So it wasn't as if fish, you know, crawled out onto land and says, ooh, I better adapt, you know, to life on land. They had already largely done that. And then we could say the same thing with the, um, uh, the uh, fins. Now, a number of fish can uh, come out onto land and walk. So when I was in South America, um, here is a catfish, um, which can come out onto land at night, breathe the air, and use its fins uh, to move uh, about. Um, there are sharks that if you, you know, observe them, you can see them using their fins to hold uh, the bottom, to walk along the bottom. They can almost stand on their pelvic fins. And so fish fins, uh, many uh, fish have adapted their fins, you know, to move them in uh, kind of a, um, a leg-like uh, uh, fashion. Um, and if we consider then the, uh, uh, these sarcopterygian fish, they weren't just modifying any old fins. Their fins, once again, had bones in the middle and muscles in the middle, which moved the, um, uh, which move the fins, just like arms and legs. So in arms and legs, there are bones in the middle, and the muscles which move the arms and legs are actually in the arms and legs. That uh, describes these uh, fins. And so if you were to ask, well, you know, if you're going to move on land, doesn't your shoulder need uh, to be different? Well, if you ask, what bones did osteichthyans have in um, their uh, shoulders? Uh, it's this. Now these bones are odd. These are the ones which connected the shoulder to the skull and the um, early amphibians would have to lose that. But if you look at these other portions here, the shoulders of amphibians to move on land, the shoulder that attaches the arm has the same bones as the shoulder of the pectoral girdle which was attaching the fin in the sarcopterygian uh, a fish. And so no new bones were needed. One just had to modify these bones. When one looks at the, pec uh, the pectoral fin of ancient sarcopterygian fish, like Liptolepis, has a lot of bones all in a row, like lungfish do today. But then when you look at uh, some of these uh, Sarcopterygian fish of uh, the Devonian, they have a modified fin. So look at Eustenopteron, for example. It has one bone in its upper fin. I have one bone in my upper arm. Here there's two bones in the middle fin. I have two uh, bones of my forearm. Then here you have smaller bones. I've got carpal bones with cartilage. I, I'm sorry, this has cartilage rays coming out of it, then I have um, fingers from there. Um, Eustenopteron was not unique. Lots of uh, fish 
in the Devonian had this setup where there was a humerus, a radius and an ulna, carpal bones, and then some even had wrist joints between carpal bones. So in other words, one didn't have to wait for fish to come out onto land to begin to adapt their fins to become arms. They were already like arms while they were still fish. And these, humor, uh, these humerus bones often had uh, this L shape, which matches the L-shaped humerus of the early amphibians. So this is homologous to the arms of the first amphibians, you know, the shape of the bones, the muscle attachments, um, uh, etc. Uh, and, and the same would be true of the, uh, of the leg where uh, the fish had the homologs of the, um, the femur, uh, the tibia, uh, the fibula, the tarsal bones, um, uh, etc. Uh, and so, um, uh, in the next video, I'll be talking about the uh, first amphibians. They do not appear suddenly. Before there were these early amphibians, there were already sarcopterygian fish, which had lungs, all right? So these fish were adapting to breathe air. They had lungs. They had moved their internal nostril. Their skull bones were already uh, adapting uh, to better be able to see on land, hear on uh, land, and all of the skull bones needed to make an amphibian skull were already in the heads of these fish. They were adapting their girdles and uh, limbs, and so the bones needed for arms and legs and the shoulder girdle were already in uh, the fish. These fish already had a humerus, a radius, an ulna, and carpal bones, uh, a femur, a tibia, a fibula, and tarsal bones. Some even had uh, a wrist uh, joint. As I'll get to in the next video, some of these actually had a neck. And so, um, in the Devonian period, there was a period of tens of millions of years where sarcopterygian fish, which had lungs, which had the same skull bones as amphibians do, which had the same uh, uh, fin bones as amphibians have in their arms and legs. These gradually adapted to land so that by the uh, Devonian, uh, the end of the Devonian period, um, modified sarcopterygian fish were then recognized as the first tetrapods, the first vertebrates adapted to land.